one analogy I like to make is imagine like the blockchain, you know, this new digital economy as a downtown area, like this thriving downtown area. Maybe right now it's not as thriving, but the, there's activity. There's like this art gallery. There's the bank where you take out a loan, like from compound. There's this uh, boutique where you buy clothes from like, you know, it's kind of like open sea or like this market. And what's weird currently is we all go there, but we kind of go in single player. We don't know who's going. We don't know who the people are. They're just numbers. We don't know what's popular. And then we go into on Twitter, like the Twitter tavern, Twitter bar, and then we talk about what we did, um, which is odd. Like we should be able to see ourselves, see which restaurants are popular, see this art gallery has people in it, you can know, see their reputation and see like, oh yeah, that, that, that account I know. I can it's cool that they bought this thing, see which areas are thriving, seeing these new op opportunities form, then relying on a asynchronous kind of social network. Like, I think a lot of it comes from surfacing that information. NFTs and all my crypto is green. I'm watching Gary V on TV. What do you mean? She wear Gucci and Louis, but her favorite Celine. My old school is old, but I keep that sh clean. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Curated by Quantstam. On today's show, we have Seb Audit, who is CEO of Zapper. Zapper is a portal to Web3. Portfolio tracking of your or somebody else's wallets, NFTs, DeFi, DAOs, swaps, bridging, and much more. We chatted a lot about social feeds, following collectors' activity, and most importantly, building in Web3, especially during a bear market. Seb also mentioned about the bundles that I wasn't aware of. Basically, you can track your holdings that might be in multiple wallets by adding them in a bundle, which is a really cool feature that I wasn't aware of. So definitely check it out. And if you guys like the episode, please hit like, subscribe, follow, all that good stuff. Cheers. All right, Seb, man, I want to start this with the question that you probably answered 4,000 times. Uh, what is Zapper? <laughs> Let's just start there and we can go from there. Yes. Um, so Zapper is uh, a portal to Web3 where you can uh, easily track your own assets in DeFi, explore different NFT collections, um, you know, do swaps, uh, bridging. It's really like this um, kind of tool set that allows you to explore Web3, interact with Web3 in a much more simple, um, simple way. Um, our focus is a lot on the um, new users that are entering the space. Like we kind of see ourselves as helping expand the range of you know uh, the audience that is you know can access Web three, and so we're kind of helping pushing that, uh, making the UX better, nicer, and I think one of them really starts with making, um, as I said, like kind of this portal where information is accessible. You can understand the different apps that exist. You can see the different NFT collections all under uh, one banner. Yeah, and I think it's an interesting question because I, I thought about this quite a bit. Like when, when I look at Zapper, there's so many things that you guys are doing and pushing boundaries on. Like what do you think about the, like what's the long-term vision? Is, is the goal to be the one like place to be for everything for newcomers? Is that kind of how you think about it? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. It's been something that I've been kind of going a lot in my mind is how to position Zapper. I think like we're in a very, very unique product segment that is kind of new and undefined. Um, but the way I kind of, uh, explain our vision is like, we're building the web three explorer. Um, and our goal is really, and to make a product analogy is like, what would a ether scan for everyone look like? Um, and so that's really something that we're building towards. Um, our expertise has always been in contextualizing blockchain information in a way that's human readable, easy to consume. We've started that expertise um, more focused on DeFi, uh, but as we kind of started building, um, you know, in DeFi, we quickly realized that these kind of categories didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we kind of were like restraining uh, ourselves to just build in one segment where there's like gaming apps that you still have staking and, you know, you earn tokens. It's not really DeFi, is it DeFi? And we're like, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Like we're just, taking things that exist on chain and translating in them in a way that's accessible and contextualized for everyone. And as we kind of continued down that road, led us to add NFTs, led us to add DAOs on Zapper. Um, 
you know, all in a format that's relatable, understandable, um, all in one place. And I think one thing that's been really important for us is that, and it's kind of like guided our product um, design moving forward is like Zapper has to feel like a rabbit hole journey. Um, and from the early days, we were very focused on the portfolio tracking side, like going back to we surface DeFi data in a way that's consumable to people. So taking complex DeFi apps and putting them in a way that is all under one place, easy to consume. Um, but then it's like realizing that that is actually an account profile and that you can then enter rabbit hole journeys. You can explore other accounts. Uh, then you can click on a specific app, see uh, the other people that are inside that app, and then click on their NFT collection, click on an item in that collection and see the history, right? Go on this rabbit hole journey that is very reminiscent to my experiences with either scan, but isn't really accessible to everyone. Like I think uh, it's very common for me to go on either scan and have like 40 tabs open because I went down, down a rabbit hole. But uh, I think to truly make Web3 accessible to everyone, we have to solve that information gap. Um, one thing that resonated with me from looking at how new people enter the space uh, is that we often take this Web2 frame of mind uh, in the sense of like you go on OpenSea and then this is OpenSea stuff. It's like NFTs. I go to DeFi Llama and this is DeFi stuff. I go to Uniswap and then it's Uniswap. The only app currently, and I, I know I'm talking a lot about Etherscan, but like the only app currently that really expresses the interconnectedness uh, of the blockchain is Etherscan. Uh, and so we're not really letting it shine properly. Um, we're still like users, new users eventually realize that it's all connected. Like they connect their wallet to different places and see the same balances and see the same NFTs. Um, but we won't, won't truly access a level of uh, knowledge to achieve adoption if we have such a wide information gap. Um, and so that's really what we're, we're focused on doing, like s bringing that on-chain information in and bringing it up to a, a level that's accessible to everyone. You. You actually already answered my question, but I'm going to still ask this again because I, I find this very interesting. So if you look at one of your competitors, like D-Bank, right, uh, yeah. they only focus on one single thing, which is like wallet tracking. So they're super simple. Whereas when I look at Zapper, it's it's everything, right? It's like a bunch of different things. And I, I, personally, what I loved about Zapper was when I started using it was like, I love that gamification thing you guys, you guys did with season one and season two and made me walk through everything. So I could imagine if some newcomer comes in and who doesn't have any idea how to like, you know, get in a pool or how to like, you know, like how to do the swap or everything. It kind of went through the process, it gamified it, it gave me the NFT and it was a really good experience. So I just wonder what's the thought process there where, you know, like the, for me, when I think about it as, as, with my founder hat on, I think, well, I like D-Bank as a product because it's very simple. But at the same time, I like Zapper as a product because one, uh, monetization becomes so easy, right? Because we, we, when you're taking fees and whatnot, so as a builder, you can actually have more time to grow because you can make money and not depending on fundraising. And secondly, it's it's a uh, you approaching a bunch of different things, so you're kind of getting people on board it. So yeah, I wonder how you think about those two different approaches. Yeah, what's well, when we were kind of going because like we started really from the portfolio tracking side, and still today, like it's a very important part of our product. Um, and kind of realized that there's two branches that come off from starting as a portfolio tracker. If you like, I don't know if they like into video games, like where you have like a texture or something, um, like the portfolio tracking side branched in, in branches in two directions. One, which is more uh, power user, probably more financial P and L stuff. And the other branch goes more into the contextualized blockchain data layer like surfacing information and more the social side as well. Like, because one thing we kind of, I don't mean like realize is like your, your portfolio tracker is also an account profile. If you look at it a different way, it's like surfacing your identity of the other things you own. Um, and so it can serve many purposes. It can serve the purpose of a heavy financialized tool, um, can also serve the purpose of, you know, whatever you have in your wallet, it's surfaced in a format that allows people to easily see what you're in, what, what you like, or what the investments you made, like what PFP collections you have. And 
from there, it's easy to branch out. Well, people then curious about others. So then you kind of start building around that social connection layer. Um, and then part of that is like exploring, right? Uh, cause then it's like exploring accounts, like diving deeper into a collection itself. Um, like it really reflects like the interconnectedness. And I think when you think about most of the time you spend in crypto, like I probably guarantee most of it is spent on a web two app. Most of the time you spend in crypto is spent like on discord. Yeah, Twitter, discord or Twitter, yeah. 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 Which is, which I think will be very odd. Uh, in a few years, it will be like, wow, we spent all this time in, in these places. Um, and the reason is, is like most of crypto is used in a very transactional way. It's like you take in information and that eventually builds intent. And then you use that intent to do a transaction. So you'll go on Twitter and you'll see a bunch of people like FOMOing into a specific collection. Perhaps that builds FOMO and then you end up buying something like the product that gets that becomes extremely valuable because then it can monetize other areas as well, like the swaps, uh, you know, buying NFTs. Like it takes the 99% of the crypto experience that's before the transaction. And that's something we're looking to really work in is like, well, a lot of information is split up across different social networks. You don't know the information you can trust. And then, well, to really solve that, you have to make the blockchain information easily to read and digest, right? You have to make it contextualized to have proper information to make better informed decisions. And so you kind of end up being like this interconnected Web3 uh, explorer uh, as I kind of laid out. And so a lot of it is focused on the information side. Like I see a lot of products focused on transactional. And I think like counterintuitively to big, build the best transactional experience, you have to build the best non-transactional experience first. Like, you know, it's like whatever before the transaction, like to help you actually make a decision is much more important than the transaction itself. So yeah, I kind of went, went off a few tangents here, but no, that's it's really how I see it. I, actually, let's, let's pick that. Let's go into social because I think it's really, I mean, also I want to talk about a lot of Zapper is instinctively social, right? So we can get into that, but I'm kind of curious about what you said there, which was in a few years from now, that would not be the case where people won't be spending time on Discord or Telegram. Oh, sorry, not Telegram, Twitter. Um, what do you think would, how would that, what does that look like from your, your perspective? Um, it's hard to say exactly how it looks like. I can say that like, typically when you have a new technology, our first reflex is to take existing technology and kind of port it over kind of like uh, you know, horse carriages and the first cars, like the first cars were very, were literally horse carriages with the motor. Um, and I think to same extent, how you view social is very similar. Like we'll take things like Twitter and have a web three spin to it. And, uh, mm. I don't think that's the way to go. Um, cause I think the way to really do it is take, think about the social dynamics that exist in crypto and build from there versus building from something outside and try to fit it onto this new, new structure. Like there's these new so social dynamics that can be formed through crypto. Like I think like some things that are interesting, right. Is, you know, when I went to NFT NYC, almost all the connections, like the people I met there came from a basis of an on-chain social dynamic, whether that was through a token, we, shared like we have owned like most of them like a pfp in this case right uh if i went to a forgotten runes uh party and i met someone and i knew who they were the only reason i knew who they were was because of an on-chain social dynamic which in this case was a pfp and so the the real life connection came from an on-chain social dynamic and when you think about big twitter profiles like let's say like pranksy or other famous collectors, like the reason they have that reputation isn't because of their Twitter following or their Twitter activity. It's because of their like massive NFT collection that they right. built over the years on chain. And so I think it starts there. It starts from on chain outwards. Um, and I think like a lot of, like I used to play World of Warcraft in a similar way, like a lot of, you know, people made friends 
from the interactions they had in that game. It wasn't like the, it's not like the other way around. Like it's like, we have this downtown, this new digital economy that has people, you know, uh, doing things. And from there, there's social, these social interactions that happen. And I think it's like building from there versus the other way around um, that would uh, really kind of, kind of yield the best results. And that's where we're kind of looking at solving it initially via that information gap. It's like um, one analogy I like to make is imagine like the blockchain, you know, this new digital economy as a downtown area, like this thriving downtown area. Maybe right now it's not as thriving, but the, there's activity. There's like this art gallery, there's the bank where you take out a loan, like from Compound. There's this uh, boutique where you buy clothes from like, you know, it's kind of like open sea or like this market. And what's weird currently is we all go there, but we kind of go in single player. We don't know who's going. We don't know who the people are. They're just numbers. We don't know what's popular. Um, and then we go into on Twitter, like the Twitter tavern, Twitter bar, and then we talk about what we did. Um, which is odd. Like we should be able to see ourselves, see which restaurants are popular, see this art gallery has people in it, you can know, see their reputation and see like, oh yeah, that, that, that account, I know that account at school that they bought this thing, see which areas are thriving, seeing these new op opportunities form, then relying on a asynchronous kind of social network. Um, like I think a lot of it comes from surfacing that information. I, I see that in in Zapper itself, you guys are like you know giving people the ability to follow other other collect other collectors and you know, um, which is kind of kind of in line with what we're talking about, right? This is where you follow the people because of which NFT communities they're a part of, right? And then kind of go from there. Um, I'm wondering, do you have? Are you thinking about any other social features that you are building? And like, how are you, yeah? What what's like the next roadmap that you're okay with sharing? I guess. Yeah, well, so one of them that we've been building for a while is like the activity feed. Um, and so it's a way to see like what the hell's going on um, on Ethereum, for example. So you get this easy to digest feed of different transactions that are really in a human readable format. So you'd be able to see like Alice.eth bought this NFT for this amount. And then you can click on it and further your rabbit hole experience through the collection. You can follow. You can follow them. You can even create lists of accounts. And so like first activity feed would be built like from you. So based on the people you follow, but you could also build lists of accounts. Um, so I could build a awesome you know, NFT collective list and others can subscribe to it and they could use that to filter the, the feed. Um, and so they'd be able to see based on these tags, what, type of activity is happening. You could have one that's like the OFAC list, right? And so a list of accounts that are sanctioned and see what they are. So it, it kind of democratizes this kind of way of tagging and building lists of accounts to kind of make that easy to access information. I think like there's a lot of, we're definitely not, ha we don't have a level playground uh, for sure. Like some have an information advantage, but I think to really level it, you have to kind of make, build the tools that allow people to freely share information, share alpha, build lists of accounts, enable people to kind of explore that. And so a lot of the activity feed is really, you know, instead of finding things on Twitter, you'd find them from that activity feed, whether it's in your NFT collection, whether it's, um, you know, a big deposit that happened in the DeFi protocol uh, or a big swap or a new token that kind of went out, you know, out of the blue. So one, one counter that I have, and I wonder how you think about this is for me, you know, when I think about like kind of what you said, like, you know, although you're correct that it is when you follow a influencer, let's in this case, you said that pranks you was because of their activity, not because of their Twitter following, but, but because they would post stuff on Twitter, like, you know, and you following the tweets, like think about punk 6529, right? Uh, it's just yeah. because you're, you are, you are like engaging with their tweets and you're, you're trying to get an understanding of who they are as a human being mm -hmm. and like, you know, their, their, their philosophy on investment and whatnot. And then that's kind of how you think about, okay, this person is how they think they're, they're making good moves, they make, you know, and I want to start looking at their track. I want to track their wallet to see if they buy some in a new collection. I want to make you know money from it or whatever. I want to be early on it. That's kind of one thing I always think about when I go from trying to follow somebody, my first 
thing is, okay, well, which people do I follow on Twitter and how can I find which, what's their wallet address and how can I track that? So I, I understand mm-hmm. a part of the list and I understand a part what you're saying, but, but doesn't, don't you think that the first step is like, to, how do I find these people's wallet and, and, and before, like, doesn't it start from outside rather than starting from inside because they're not like really chatting over there? Is that, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. I mean, like, yes and no, in the sense of a lot of their following was built on the pillar of them owning something and then being active like it comes somewhere from their on-chain activity and again like right. the continued building like if you have a ape punk and you create a twitter account don't post obviously you're not good your following isn't just going to grow just because you have an ape punk but it acts like as a a pillar from what to, to, to build on like if pranks didn't have um that massive collection right probably wouldn't have that that following on twitter then again, like, I think one thing that's interesting when then like, I totally agree with your point. Like you want to see how they're thinking and then go back to a feed. But the reason you go back to the feed is like it acts as this source of truth where you can measure words versus actions. Um, right. and so the, the part I'm going from is where the social kind of dynamic comes from is comes from like that source of truth. Uh, cause it gives you a better gauge into kind of knowing the person in a way, like, does the actions of this person on chain correlate to what they tweet about? It also informs you from an identity perspective. So I don't like necessarily literally mean from like importing things from one to the other, but more from like a, the, the source of what, where truth happens, building that pillar of like social dynamic. So, okay, well, let's say that's, that's a starting point. Like, you know, makes sense because if they are the kind of person who is making good decisions on chain, then makes sense because you want to follow them because you want to, you know, you want to learn from that or, you know, uh, financial incentive or whatever it might be. Um, how do you think after that, like after the initial part, do you also think about like that the conversation should happen within Zapper or should it happen outside of Zapper? Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that a lot of things can be built in parallel to that. It's like you have this source of truth and then from that you can build like the conversation side, the messaging angle, the comments, like maybe the fee is also a mix of comments, messages and transactions. Like a lot can be built from that, but I don't think it works from the building a Twitter first then into on-chain transactions. It builds from the source of truth and then you kind of decorate that or enrich that with like words or like being able to message other folks. Um, and, and, ideal, and ideally, also have native native Web three features based on what they're doing and what the what the what yeah. the act, what yeah. The, yeah. What's What's interesting is like I don't know. Maybe there's a lot of interesting people in Web three that nobody know about because they don't have a Twitter account or Telegram. They're just like hidden. Like I feel like there's just you know Ethereum while the blockchain is like a, a dark forest and there's a bunch of secrets and there's probably a lot of things you can learn or interesting accounts that you can get that you'd never get from an outside source. Cause at one point, like, you know, a lot of these notable Twitter accounts that based somewhere their prominence from ancient activity, there's like all the others that never did that. Right. I mean, I mean you're absolutely correct. Like I'm, I'm generalizing, but I actually had uh, the guys from hologram in the last show. And if you don't know what hologram they're building. No, I don't. So they're building the, you know, like how G money has an uh, avatar, like he only speaks yeah. on, on on Zoom or, and so they're building the AI software for that, where mm. you can have your NFT and you can use it on the Zoom calls or, or Twitch or wherever, right? And and uh, and I was chatting with them and I asked them, I'm like, like who is your primary customer? And they said, our primary customers are shy people. And I was like, interesting. Mm. And I was like, because they're like, if you think about it, there are so many people on crypto who don't want to put their face out. They're not even that they're, it's not even about that they want to keep anonymous. It's just that they're shy. They, whenever a camera is hit on them, they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're introverts. And I was like, that's very interesting. But you're right. If you think about now tying this to what you were saying, if you think about the people who don't even know in crypto, if starting from Ethereum, starting at a dollar to where it is right now, or Bitcoin, there are so many people who have made millions of bucks who are really good at all behind the scenes stuff, but they don't put themselves out on Twitter. Uh, on-chain activity is probably the best source of truth, like you mentioned. Um, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, you talked about messaging. So I, I think I saw D bank is building messaging, uh, thing, a uh, messaging feature. Is that something else you guys are also building, uh, or looking? Uh, it's something we're definitely thinking about doing. Yeah. Um, I think the way we want to tackle it is 
it has to solve a existing problem. I think we, I think everyone agrees that messaging will happen in one shape or another in crypto in the future, like Web3 native messaging. I think what's very unclear is the way to get there um, is like, do you build like this fully baked product at, kind of like Telegram initially, and then that works? Do you have to tackle a, a specific problem and maybe the messaging kind of um, grows out of it? So there's like a bunch of different strategies. We'd be more from the latter, uh, being that messaging has to serve a purpose for a feature or something that makes it better. And then you can at least start like some sort of a network effect with a small audience. I think it's like the hardest thing because it, since it's something that lives on network effects, like it, it the, the messaging will only be as good as the amount of people that use it. And yep. it's something that's really hard to do. And I think like a lot of people, what they're kind of approaching it through is like token gating. So you can start with one community and try to get something going, but it's like really hard to do. And I think it's going in from like the product problem solving angle, I think gives you a better chance of succeeding to kind of get it. Um, Cause it's not something of like you build the end product that's going to be used in five years. It doesn't mean it's going to work today. It's not like it has to, it has to, you have to plant a seed somewhere that it can grow into that. Um, and so if, you know, we're planning to do that, it has to have some sort of base onto an existing problem. Yeah, and, and I, um, I'm sure you've thought about this, and I wonder if in your brainstorming sessions you've you've talked about this. Like, if people were messaging each other, like, first of all, do you think they will? Like, within, like, you know, within, without, if there's no context, and if yes, like, what what, what would be the context? Like, why would they be messaging? Is it like, hey, I want to make it? I'm just brainstorming here, but would it be like something like, hey, uh, you know, I'm trying to buy an ENS domain, or I'm trying to buy an you know, example, a specific NFT, and I'm trying to reach out to the person, is that, would that be the reason? But is that, is that even a good enough reason? Like, what would be the reason do you think that people will be messaging each other? Yeah, well, so there's an, a feature that we're building, um, that which is uh, peer-to-peer NFT trading. Mm-hmm. And so that, there's a lot of, like, negotiation that goes in, into that. So it's like, you know, I you know I have a board ape, and I'm interested in getting into Zuki. Right. Um, and I'll have a lot of discussions on Twitter or Telegram, like the negotiation part. And so it's like an element maybe you can integrate with because there's a, it's like very informal. It's like, oh, add two ETH to your offer, add another, I don't know, board ape, whatever. Like there is con- conversational elements that perhaps you can't solve with just pure UI. And I think like that's an area where you could start some sort of messaging uh, but it's very contextualized towards helping you conduct this trade. So those are those are the kind of the ways that we're kind of thinking about it. But yeah, I think it's like to your point is why would I use it? Like yep. in what situation do I absolutely need would need a web three product to message yep. um, someone? And like the list is short, like of, of problems or you actually need it. The future is going to be very different, but. Uh, we have to work with the market that currently exists and the problems that currently exist. Yep. And also, I, I think like a product like Zapper is most likely to win because um, like no one wants to download a brand new app for just that one feature, yeah. in my opinion, right? Just like you yeah. have to be integrated somewhere where you're already using it and now you can do that over there where, where all the wallets are already there, basically, right? So yeah. not, you're not going, it's like otherwise a chicken and egg problem, right? Kind of like, kind of like a, Etherscan where, or the block scan when they launched their messaging thing, it's like you both have to be on there, otherwise it doesn't work. If I send a message and another person's not on that app, it's, it's totally it's totally useless. Um, yeah, and that's one of like the toughest, yeah, toughest parts is like right now we're kind of say open is like it relies on email for you to get a notification that you have a you got an offer. Like there's no other channel that open can rely for sure that you, you know. They want you to get that information, but there's no place currently that's Web3 native where people go every day to check like their messages. While we're talking about that same thing, which we're like, you know, the the, the 
the, the chicken and egg thing or the thing or the and even with your product i'm guessing notifications become a big thing right especially when you're looking at activity and stuff like that so is the goal to move to an app at some point or do you, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm i haven't done my homework with the app mobile side of things so you guys have an app i don't even know that I should have asked that yeah we do have an app <laughs> okay, uh, ios sense. and android okay but yeah notifications are something we are planning on having it works especially well with our activity feed it's like every time an account does something you could get a notica- notification or anytime like a on-chain event happens, you'd be able to get a notification. I think that's really important, just like you're from a product angle, because you need to think about like what's, like as a product builder, you need to think about what's the pull of someone going back to your app the next day in the context of Zapper as well. People want to see their portfolio. Uh, is it up? Is it down? And then notifications is a good one because it's a pull back into the product. It has to be useful because otherwise notifications can easy, easily go on the annoying side. Yeah. Um, but as a product builder, it's a very good thing to have and also solves like a, a user problem of like knowing when something happens when people, people are offline, like the off, offline information segment. Um, and yeah, it serves a good, you know, a good strategic value on that side. Uh, one question that I had was like more for myself because and I, and I want to know if you think this is like a true behavior or not is like when I think about like stocks like you know so like I I only have a very small amount of stocks I don't buy a bunch of stocks I don't put like you know as compared to crypto or web3 where you buy freaking a lot of shit <laughs> and right and so and so it's interesting because with that you know I have my portfolio tracker app where I don't never usually connect my bank account and just write down how much quantity I have or like, you know, whenever I make the change, it's very simple to, to manage, right? I might, I'm guessing it might be different for somebody who's a day trader or somebody who's like, you know, doing it every day. Uh, but when it comes to uh, crypto and NFTs, when I use Zapper, like what I would do is I would have my one wallet, then I would, you know, like log or sign out of that wallet and go to the next wallet and I'll see my portfolio in every, you know what I mean? Every wallet because I have multiple wallets. I wonder if that's a common feature that you really see with people. And two, have you thought about like anything that aggregates that or like, or like, you know, yeah. I wonder how if that's been yeah. discussed. What is the common behavior, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So it is a problem and yeah. we have a solution. It's a, okay. perhaps a bit too hidden a feature, but you can create a bundle of wallets. It's like a folder of addresses and then view that as an account. Oh, um, nice. And so you could create, I don't know, my my bundle, whatever the name is, and you can put your five, six, 10 addresses in there and then view that as an account uh, in aggregate. Cool. Uh, I might have I might have not done my homework, but we should definitely clip that out. <laughs> it's a really good feature if people don't, I don't know if people know about this or not. No, but yeah, a- definitely. We should, we should keep it because maybe it's too hidden or maybe we have to bring it more forward. You do people know about it. Maybe I just don't know about it, but it's crazy because every time I would go and like, you know, like connect the next wallet and connect the next wallet and see it individually, which was, uh, so it's so cool that you guys have that. Um, how are you guys acquiring new users and how is it changing as NFT and DeFi collides? Yeah, so early on our user acquisition strategy was just adding every protocol under the sun that existed. And so, you know, starting early on from say 10 protocols in early DeFi, um, adding the 11th, added you like add an exposition, exposition to a new community um, that would then reshare it. Um, you know, we'd get good activity from Discord. And then there's like a network effect of like the more integrations we had, the more valuable we became to users. And every time we added a new one, we'd get exposition to, to new users. I think it's also, there's definitely like a surfing the wave part in the sense of as we um, were building, DeFi was also growing. And so the amount of people that had the problem of tracking their portfolio also increased. Um, and because there was, weren't a lot of products in the market, like there's still like two or three that do what we do. And so yeah, we're able, we are able to capture a lot of growth. In the bear market, it's very different. And so I'd fall back to our initial strategy before like the crazy uh, bull market is to identify like these small markets that fit in your product vision, or you can build a product that, you know, can go from zero to one. And it's like often markets that people are overlooking. They're markets with a, that are very small, but 
very active user base. And the best ones are those that people overlook that become much bigger in the future. And I think it, it comes from like, becomes like a skill to be able to identify those markets. You have to like, you know, Paul Graham says like live in the future and build what's missing. So you have to be at the edge of what's going on. You have to be consistently like looking um, to kind of identify these new problems, these new markets. And the best thing that can happen is when like, oh, I actually have this problem. It's a very small market. And I feel like I have an information advantage. I feel like I'm lucky to know this um, because I, I have this feeling that this is going to be much bigger in the future. And like a lot of that, like I felt that way early in DeFi. It's like, it's like, oh shit. Like I, it's kind of like I, I discovered this thing. It's like an, almost at the time, like everyone in DeFi was like the shared secret that we had. Like, like we all had this confidence that this would become much larger. Um, and when you actually face a problem, it gives you so much more confidence. Um, cause otherwise you're kind of working off trends. Um, you, you're kind of like, it's hard to build conviction and, becomes very easy to fall into the trap of like, yeah, chasing trends. Like what's the current hot thing? Like two years ago, or even like a year, no, two years ago, nobody was thinking of building an NFT marketplace except OpenSea. They knew something before a lot of people. And then when they become successful, that's when a lot of people start building NFT marketplaces. And that's where you want to find yourself is identifying those things. And that's the best way to grow your user base. Um, Cause otherwise you always end up riding the wave of your products. Like if we stayed in the portfolio tracking lane, I mean, we still are to, to, yeah, to, to some extent, uh, you limit yourself to the growth of that market. Whereas if you establish like this larger product vision and identify these smaller markets that kind of work off each other, then you're able to, um, continue the, the growth curve. It's kind of like how a lot of, um, products grew initially, they built from a market and then, uh, with time built, expanded through other markets, but under an umbrella of a shared kind of product, product vision. You talked about Paul Graham. Um, what are some of the, I guess, biggest differences you see when building in web two versus web three? And like, do you think the ideologies or like the foundational stuff or in general, like most of the stuff do you think still stands or yeah. How do you think about that? In terms of like building product? Yeah, it is a building product, a building startup, yeah. I think it's it's the same thing. It doesn't really matter whether it's web two, web three. I think it's more of like how you do it. I think like you can still apply, like it depends. Like if you're building a product, it's different from building a protocol. Like it's, I think it's very hard to think about what problems Ethereum <clears throat> solved initially without going into a much longer term like problem here. like you had to start from something of people tinkering uh, it's like not as clear what the initial problem was like it's probably like oh this sounds like something that would be big in the future cool and it's just people tinkering and building um so it's very different from building products but i think yeah you can apply like a lot of the same things from web 2 to web 3 and i think like people in web 3 perhaps think too much about the protocol approach but they kind of forget the users and what the problem they have yeah. is. Um, it becomes very, like the biggest mistake I, I saw is people mistaking adoption for, um, they have a token and then a bunch of people became interested and they mistake that for product market fit. Like honestly, yeah, invest, most invest, investors for users kind of thing. Yeah. It's like, honestly, yeah. most, most DeFi protocols, unfortunately, yep. like miss you know, mistake that for product market fit. And I think if you'd started more from a problem solving approach, you, would, you know, you would have found it, most of them would still be here right today. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it's definitely, it's, it's tough, but there's, you know, it's finding solving user, user problems, building something that people love, like it still exists today, no matter what. Yeah. It's funny you say the, 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 the adoption versus you know, like actual people like who are actually using you and like versus like people who are in it for the money. I feel like same to NFTs, right? Like like the power of 10,000 people building 
brands on your IP is super powerful. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, right. But, but are they really excited with your IP or are they in it for the quick money? Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think there is, there is a passing of the chasm. I think like, I think board apes have passed that chasm that you see now, you know, like Nelk boys launching a beer and like, you know, people launching the burger mm-hmm. and sh- shop and whatnot. But, but so I, I'm not saying that it has to be, but I think there's a chasm there where it has to hit yeah. that mainstream level or there has to be so much um, like, you know, love for the, the, what is the, for the project IP that you're like, I want to go build on this, which I think it's very interesting. Yeah. It's uh, I think one thing that's interesting too is like the ultimate growth hack of crypto so far has been people making money and more people wanting to make, make yeah. money. Um, yeah. I don't want to go like in the cynical route, but like a lot of like growth came that way. Um, yeah. But initially it didn't really look that way. Cause like, if you think about board ape early on, like people weren't really looking to make money. It's like they wanted to build a shared community that they can participate in. Um, what, what's really hard is building a product in a bull market. I find it way harder to build in the bull market, a product than in a bear market. Um, and going into this bear market, I kind of, you know, change my frame of reference of thinking of bull versus bear. And like bear market is the market. This is the market. This is our users with real problems that are using it for the right reasons. The bull market is like this bonus thing that happens um, every once in a while. Yeah. But this is the adoption that we have. This is, I assume that this is the market it's and we're solving products for these users. Um, yeah. Versus of like building, like, cause like a lot of users in the bull market perhaps won't stick, perhaps they're there more for speculative reasons. And so the trap you set yourself uh, into is solving for a problem for a user base that won't exist in a few months. Um, or it's like a very mild problem. Um, yep. But under that surface, there's like actual users that really care that have real problems. And in bull markets, they're under bunch of layers of speculation they're kind of like hidden away and it's extremely hard to really get that and yeah. it's easy to trick yourself too into thinking like this is actual adoption like i think everyone had like the, these mental um tricks we're playing on ourselves like is this real adoption or not like it's really hard to to know for a fact yeah and i also saw a lot of people like you know building features for the I, I call them I cannot call them investors because they're not technically investors, but but that's why I'm using quotes here. But like I saw people building features for investors and thinking that they are the users, but they were actually investors. They were not the users, yeah. right? So which it com- leads to completely wrong feature set because if you're trying to you know what I mean, like they are they are they're not users. They are investors. Like, you know, like I, the people who are buying NFT collections for the most part for IP, they're not going to be the ones you're going to be selling to. As in like yeah. the, if you made a movie. Sure, they'll watch it, but they're not the mainstream audience that's going to get to the point where it become, the brand becomes worth the value, right? That's a whole different audience, Audience, whereas these guys are the people who kind of like funded your your building of a movie, your IP, basically, right? It's an interesting thing. What I've, one thing I've seen, by the way, is I wonder, I don't know what it is, but I have seen a lot of companies now competitively get accepted with like nothing, like no, even like building the same thing, right? Like build, some, someone building a disca- uh, Discord killer easier to get accepted as compared to you know back in the day with yc where they would pick up the first two like open c uh, sorry not open c sorry um who was going with example uh anyways like early uh, yc early it's like before the crypto main like before the nft yeah, main, yeah, yeah. Out, right they would be very specific on the ones that pick but i feel like it's my assumption here because there was so many mo- companies making so much money with crypto and nfts that i felt like this is, this is just a hypothesis here but i felt like yc got under pressure and they were like, we gotta like start taking, accept, give, be more lenient. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we're gonna lo- we're not gonna be able to get our, we're gonna we're not gonna be able to get this investment because they have options now, because yeah. the money was like free flow. I don't know what you think about that, but I've seen that happen quite a bit lately. Yeah, I think it's also like a good period of like YC success was like in a global economy bear market, like after two thousand eight, like like a lot of the best performing startups, although like just by default most of the startups that are well known by yc will be older ones because they have more time to become like billion dollar companies but i think this i was reading some of his essays that like the type of entrepreneur that 
kind of comes to life in a in a bear market is different from you know kind of like the VC bubble we had where people were kind of just chasing these multiples like just wanting to go a series a then multiple and b and then exit eventually like i think i think there's maybe that as well like i don't know you know if it kind of uh, that pressure found its way into yc but i think it's perhaps like the type of entrepreneur um, or like the the market makes it harder maybe to find like who the real product builders are yeah. Yeah. I mean, interesting to see how the, now the bear market, how like it is it bring it back. I'm guessing it probably will bring it back to the equilibrium uh, with like less funding and less options. And I always find it very fascinating because I saw so many, uh, so many, all of a sudden, like so many crypto companies going through YC. And I was like, huh, it's fascinating that that was not the case, but I think they're more lenient right now because of that assumption. But um, yeah, it's like the yeah. level of conviction you need to start a company in crypto in a bear market is way higher than the conviction you need to build in a bull market. Yeah, It's like, and so it does build it. Um, like I think typical like crypto founders have a hard shell because one, they're building in an industry that's still like very controversial. And so you have to defend a lot like the interest of your industry. Like I don't think a, a SaaS founder has the same level of controversy applied to their their industry of field or field it's um and so just by default of that like a lot of developers very talented ones don't want to work in crypto there's also like the market is just like yo-yoing all the time and so you, you also have to be resilient towards that it's also like you know as i said like there's people you know doubting uh, a lot of products being built and so it's like to be a, a founder in crypto in a bear market is like you have to have that level of conviction that you won't necessarily need in you know type of markets where everyone's kind of making money like you have to have like good reasons to do something yeah do you think it also it's interesting because i man i've heard stories i have a so i, I went to yc in winter 2016 i have a oh, wow. buddy yeah i have a nice. buddy who i have a buddy who like uh also, also went through YC in my, in my batch and then I had a chat with him last year and he was telling me how he did an ICO back in 2017, raised 30 million and didn't convert ETH to USDC. Uh, and the bear market happened. I remember it's something like that, but he had like his most of his thing just completely shrunk and he had a bunch of employees and he had no other option but to convert ETH to USDC at the bottom of the market because Oof. he had 80 employees. Yeah. And it was fascinating to think about that. I was like, man. Holy shit, it's a good point. And then same thing, I was listening to a podcast with um, Kevin Rose and he said that when he did the proof sale and he, with all the with everything included, he uh, with Moonbirds, I mean, uh, with the uh, secondary sales and everything, he think they did about 200 million. And he said, uh, Gary V told him to change everything into USDC because each markets are unpredictable. You don't know, right? If you're building a business long-term, you need to have that. I just wonder, man, like think about people like who had like all that eat and they have to pay salaries. Like at one point you're like, let's hire, let's hire a bunch of people. Let's go. Like, you know, you have this crazy <laughs> energy and all of a sudden like that happens. And then, you know, you're five, five times your, you're like one, you know, one, one fifth of your, of your holdings. And you're like, oh shit. And now you got to, yeah. you know, we're the storm and your valuation is super high and all that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, tough. it's also like even thinking about a lot of the rounds that were raised in the bull market, it's like very tempting for a founder to raise at high valuations. Um, yep. But then if a bear market hits like we're currently hitting, you're making it's much harder to do a, another raise because you set the expectations so high then you need to get like a multiple or like a down round is, is like really not a great thing. Um, or you potentially don't, you're not able to, you know, do a fundraise because the valuation was just way too high. And so it's like all these things where you like mental tricks that the market can play on you, where it's like, you have to think for the long term. Like it's also hard because you're like very, optimistic by nature so it's like yeah things are gonna 
go well. Like I just raised a bunch of ETH in this ICO. I believe in ETH. I'm just going to keep ETH. Yep. Right? It's like very easy, like founders very optimistic by nature, but then there's like the flip side of that of like, you want to be able to achieve your vision and build the product you want to build. And if you can't get there, then yeah, was, was min maxing for the best valuation and the bull market, the best thing, probably not. Um, I want to end with this last couple of questions. Uh, one, I want to, I want to ask you, cause I read your tweet in which you said, you know, Zapper started off as a side project, right? And, and I saw the tweet that you created where you had it, you put it in the, you know, people shared it on tw Twitter and you, you saw there was legit a mark, like people had the same, had the problem and you're like, you, you kind of found the uh, product market fit. I wonder like if you were working for folks who are listening and want to, you know, who are entrepreneurs or uh, want to start, start their own startup and it's a great time to start right now. Um, if you were working on side projects on the weekend right now, what were some of the things you'd be looking at trying to solving? I would tend to go from, I'd say like push your own curiosity, explore different things just for exploring. And as you're kind of discovering new things, like in this context of like Web3, like pay attention to problems that you're facing and remove the bias of trying to turn it into a business. The reason is because I found that you might dismiss really good ideas because they sound like bad mm. ideas that can't be turned into a business. And I, it's a, like easy trap to fall into. And I, I think it's like, just notice problems. That's it. Like, don't think about if that's great business potential or anything, just so you don't have that. Yeah. That easy, like, yeah, but this hat will have all these issues. And so you're kind of going to dismiss it. Um, I think like build something as quickly as possible and have it, used by who you think your audience is. Like if you're actually facing the problem, then you probably know where to find other users that also have that problem. And so I would build something super quickly and just get to my uh, direct audience. Like that's how a lot of, how I, you know, built products in the past and how Zapper came from, like came from this small problem I had. It like made zero business decision early on because DeFi had, 10 million in TVL, um, there's like seven protocols. And so wow. my user base had to be someone that was in at least four of those seven and had like a good amount of money invested. So it made sense for them to use Zapper. So like early on, it didn't make a lot of sense to build yeah. a business out of it, but it's just like, I think DeFi is going to be bigger. Um, and then as a result, there's probably business potential, but I wasn't thinking too much about it uh, from that angle. And so I think it's, it's important to go there. And also because I was a user that had that problem, I know exactly where to find other users. Um, other than that, like, honestly, I think it'd be very hard to solve a problem where you don't, you're not experiencing, like there's a bunch of great startups that started in a way where they weren't solving uh, founders problems. Um, I have no idea how I, I built that way because that's not how I, I build products. Um, but yeah, going from something you experience as a problem makes things much easier. Man, Zapper was when started was ten. The DeFi TVL was ten million. Yeah, it was <laughs> really crazy. small. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, okay, well, just follow. Just kind of following up on that. Uh, is there any problems that Zapper is not building on that's pissing you off right now that you're feeling? You're like, I wish somebody build that. That Zapper is not focusing on. Yeah, but a lot of them Zapper is, is building. It's focusing on. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them um, are still just like, projects. I like like the one I alluded to is like the period. Of people. Yeah, because like if I have problems, I'll probably be already building something yeah. to solve them. Um, because yeah. they're yeah, um, because otherwise it becomes really easy for me to go into trends or problems I think exist. Um, and I think that's a, another trap that people tend to fall into. So I mean, the problems I I, I kind of spoke to was around peer-to-peer um, -peer NFT trading. Actually, I think there's a few around like helping startups do like that have on-chain treasuries do accounting or payment. Like we've built our own internal solutions for that. I think there's potential there as well. But yeah. Other than that, we tend to build cool. things that we have problems for. Very cool. Last question before we get into the rapid fire is you're a punk holder. Uh, what do you think of the direction punks are going under Yuga and Noah's stewardship? And do you think it's still worth 
buying one today, obviously not financial advice. Yeah. What do you think about the whole punk ecosystem? I think it, it doesn't matter who owns them or what they do with it. Um, I think the most bullish thing for punks is that there's nothing happening with them and people still want to buy them. Yeah. Um, so there's not that expectation of utility. And I think that's a very hard to do. And so punks are like a really unique position. Um, I think there's like also like a huge Lindy effect with punks is that they've survived to this point. They've had a collector base through the cycles uh, that were passionate about collecting them. It changed in size across time, but like the more they stick around, the more likely they are to stick around. And the fact that in the last NFT market, they were really installed as the original kind of PFP. Yeah. I don't see that changing. It's not like we're going to, maybe with the you know new Zapper, people are going to find new NFT collections that they didn't know existed. But no, um, I think like now they are like the grail of PFPs. And I think regardless of what terms of utility happens, um, that's going to happen. So it's like a, a leverage bet in a way on you know, the Ethereum ecosystem, because as long as Ethereum sticks around, crypto punks are going to be like the, you know, story on that started like the, you know, PFPs and NFTs, like they're the seed, basically. That's a great answer. Amazing. All right, let's do rapid fire. So eight questions and let's go. First one, one line or one sentence, whatever comes to mind. So number one is, and you cannot say punks, uh, because we know it's probably your favorite one, but favorite PFP collection, it's other than punks. I really like Azuki. Cool. Yeah. Uh, number two, which upcoming artists would you like to spotlight? Could be founder, could be a creator, it could be anything. Anybody you like to spotlight? Yeah, could be a team. I, uh, I love, um, yeah, Fuck Render. He uh, became a friend of mine, but he uh, introduced me to a lot of like what, you know, the NFT art space is like attributed a lot of my, like my learning. Like it was interesting because it was kind of the bridging of two worlds. I was coming from the DeFi side DeFi. and the NFT side. And so I gained a lot from meeting him. It like exposed me to another side of crypto that I didn't know much of. Like I obviously knew of the PFP collections, but it's like, oh shit, like the, there's like legit things happening here. So yeah, shout out to him. And also like I do own a few, a few pieces from uh, for Grindr. It's amazing. Uh, which teams are you most bullish on? I mean, the, to me, like Uniswap is, I'm still very bullish on them. You know, every product that came out of Uniswap, um, although there's not that many, have been always high quality, very polished, serve a very interesting problem with a very creative solution. So I'm, I'll always be very bullish on that team. They also like help bring the space forward. Uh, they push the boundaries as well in terms of innovation. So it's like a team that I look up to. Cool. Uh, what projects are underrated? I think Manifold is underrated. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Uh, favorite Twitter account accounts? Uh, there's so many. Um, I, I like Fiscantes. Um, I know there's always like a part of like shit posting, but also like the one off very smart post. But cool. Number six is brand, individual, or team you would like to see in Web3? Like an existing brand? Yeah, yeah. From Web2 world, basically. Yeah. You know, like I'd love to see um, more, um, more brands that are building like media franchises uh, experiment with the space. Like, I don't know, Pokemon, Nintendo. I think that'd right. be sick. Yeah. Cool. They've also um, been like super on, you know, innovative. So I don't know. It'd be cool to see them do something in Web3. Uh, number seven, advice to new artists, builders, or teams entering Web3. Keep it simple. Don't get distracted by trends. Just stay focused on small problems. Um, build high quality things. And yeah, just don't, don't get distracted. Love it. And last question is one prediction for 2023. Could be in any realm, NFTs, crypto, whatever. Specifically, it could be about any anything. Something we don't expect will happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think we're gonna see um, 
a new narrative uh, lift off. I think we're still kind of dusting off from the, uh, we're still hung over from the crazy bull market we just had. I think uh, next year is really when we're going to see these new narratives and new um, industries form, just like with DeFi and NFTs. And I think it's really the time to pay attention. And it might not look like a bull market, but it might be the seed for one. Love it. Well, thanks, Seb. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can people find you and Zapper? Yeah, so you can follow uh, follow my Twitter account, uh, Seb Audet. 26. Uh, and also you can find Zapper at zapper.fi and on Twitter, uh, zapper underscore fi. This channel is intended purely for educational purposes and does not constitute financial or tax advice. 100 NFTs and all my crypto is free. I'm watching Gary V on TV. What do you mean? She wear Gucci and Louis, but her favorite Celine. My old school is old, but I keep that shit.